In the heart of New England, a groundbreaking project is taking place. The New England Clean Energy Connect is a transmission line project that will deliver 1,200 megawatts of hydropower to the New England electrical grid. A new converter station, substation, and crucial system upgrades are all part of this monumental endeavor. This includes 54 miles of new transmission lines and 91 miles of lines that will be upgraded. The project will increase the grid's reliability, lower rates, and significantly reduce our carbon footprint. But it's not just about power lines and technology. It's about innovation, progress, and relationships, all of which require a dynamic legal team to foster the process. Pierce Atwood has been there every step of the way, and this is their story. The New England Clean Energy Project is so amazing for Maine and the region. I would start off number one with the environment. You have, we rely a lot on natural gas here in, in New England, um, and that has significant amount of carbon emissions associated with it. And by creating this uh, transmission connection to Quebec, we can bring this existing hydro into New England and displace natural gas and reduce a significant amount of carbon emissions. But in addition to that, there's a huge economic impacts. We've seen most recently big increases in gas prices that's driven electric prices way up. This has the effect of suppressing those prices, reducing prices across all of New England. In addition, it means property taxes for the local communities, uh, wonderful jobs, particularly for craftspeople that are either are uh, looking to come back to Maine where their home is and work here or develop a new set of skills. One of the things that NECEC brings to New England is an opportunity to showcase the fact that the New England states can act together to achieve some important common objectives. One of them is system reliability. Another is economic benefit to electricity customers. A third is helping achieve some of the very aggressive and I think appropriate carbon reduction targets in New England. And NECEC brings all of those together and, and, and shows that Maine policy and Massachusetts policy and Maine's efforts and Massachusetts efforts together with the rest of Southern New England can work together effectively. When I was asked to be involved in this, somebody said to me, why are you doing this? And I said two words, climate change and what's going on. I am devoted to doing whatever I can between now and the end of my life to help address the terrible consequences of the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this corridor is going to offer a singular opportunity for Maine to do what Governor Mills has asked us to do, and that is to lead the way. Maine can't wait, and I really believe that. I think the people of Maine that were leading the charge on this project from the government and the Public Utilities Commission and two governors, one Republican, one Democrat, agree this is a great project. And uh, that led us to a place where included benefits for Somerset County, like broadband uh, fiber optics, affordable housing, land conservation, something we're all into, conserving corridors along waterways. Uh, there are a lot of benefits for Somerset County. For any project, the developer has to obtain all the necessary permits, all the necessary approvals, all the necessary contracts. And you've got to do that, you know, efficiently so you can get it done. For the NECEC, it's such a large project, 145 miles long here in Maine, it required a lot of different permits from the federal government, from the Maine state government, and local towns all of which you have to obtain. It was also though very, it was selected in an RFP, meaning it was a solicitation, and it had a lot of competing businesses, developers of other projects who stood to lose money if the NECC moved forward. So they really amounted a very aggressive opposition campaign. And what they did, they contested every permit. Every permit, they then appealed every decision. They brought lawsuits challenging different aspects of the project. And ultimately they tried twice to have the voters of Maine enact the referendum to stop the project. Our opponent's strategy has always been delay. Throughout the regulatory proceedings, they try to muddy the waters, you know, confuse the process um, where there is a pretty straightforward, clear process with defined, rules defined in statute, rules defined in the department's own rules. 
Um, but it was part of their strategy to delay in an effort to fatally um, kill the project. Anytime you have a transmission line that um, needs to get built, you need to get approval from the main Public Utilities Commission in order to do that before you can even put a shovel in the ground. Um, and so the kind of approval that the Maine Public Utilities Commission gives is a certific certificate of public convenience and necessity. And basically, it's uh, you have to establish that there is a um, public need for the project, which basically justifies its construction. And the standard that the Maine Public Utilities Commission uses is in looking at whether there's a public need for the project is, is this project in the public interest? So in order to get the approval, you have to establish that the facts and have the commission make a legal conclusion that the project is in fact in the public interest for the state of Maine to be built. Ultimately, the NECEC, with help from Pierce Atwood, obtained all permits needed for construction to continue. Nevertheless, the opposition remained. Black versus Cutco was an action brought in Maine Superior Court by a coalition of opponents to the NECEC project against the Bureau of Parks and Lands and CMP, the purpose of which was to challenge the legality and validity of a lease that the Bureau of, of Parks and Lands granted to CMP for the purposes of constructing a portion of the NECEC project. The lease at issue in Black versus Cutco dealt with 0.9 miles of the 145 miles, but it was the opponent's hope and intention that if that lease could be invalidated, then the, the chain, in a sense, could be broken and there could be no way to construct the project. So it was intended as an effort to block and impede the entirety of the project. So the establishing uh, forever the validity of the lease was crucial to preventing the opponents of the project from disrupting the entirety of the project. So with respect to the citizen-initiated referenda, there were two of them. And among the many challenges that this project faced, these two citizen-initiated referenda were two of the biggest challenges. And the timing and the substance of these two separate, really I'd call them political campaigns, is an important part of the story of the project and the project's development and ultimately its ability to proceed. The first initiative was one that was uh, targeted directly at uh, the NECEC uh, and would have compelled the PUC to reverse its decision approving the project. So it named the NECEC uh, directly and would have required the PUC to reverse its prior decision that approved the project. So we challenged the first initiative uh, and argued that uh, it wasn't even legislation that could be adopted via initiative. The main constitution requires that an initiative be actual legislation, which means that it has to be generally applicable, not just targeted at a single individual or a small group of individuals. And we argued that it was so targeted that it didn't even count as legislation. And the law court agreed with us and held that the initiative uh, violated the Constitution. It was essentially an executive action that could not be adopted by a ballot initiative. The problem with the second initiative or the second citizens referendum was timeliness. Because by the time the first referendum failed and they got around to the second referendum, the company was ready to begin construction. So September 2020, they're just getting the process started. They're looking at an election or a vote in November of 2021. The company at this point was ready to start construction and did start construction in January of 2021, 10 months before the second referendum went to the ballot. And our argument on the second referendum was, hey, you're too late. We've already started construction we vested our rights to build the project. So vested rights, as determined by the law court, Maine's highest court pre-trial, are constitutionally protected property rights. And what that means is, for a developer in this context, if you have a valid final permit and you proceed to build something pursuant to that permit in good faith, meaning you expend considerable sums of money um, to build the project pursuant to a schedule that was not expedited. And a new law comes along that if applied retroactively would prevent you from finishing the project. 
it cannot apply. If you have proceeded in good faith, spent money to build the project, and in this case, the developer spent $450 million, that new law cannot be applied to prevent you from completing your project pursuant to your valid permit. A main jury unanimously decided that the NECEC did in fact have vested rights, and that decision cleared the way for construction to resume. The NECEC is really a once-in-a-generation project. Maine needs a lot more clean energy if it's to achieve its clean energy goals to, to fight climate change. And the project provides is the best source for clean energy really that you can have at the level that Maine needs. Um, for the firm, it's really just the kind of project we want to work on. It's complex, it requires a lot of different legal skills, and it's important for the state and important for the region. And we really want to be a firm that you know, is involved in major projects across New England.